Good morning, Bethany. I said, good morning, Bethany. Yay. Good morning. All right. Let's stand and sing. We're so glad that you came out today. We're so happy to be worshiping together. We're going to start today by singing goodness of God. Let's stand together and sing. to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you give ear O Lord to our prayer that attend to the voice of our supplications in the day of trouble we will call upon you for you will answer us among the gods there is none like you O Lord nor are there any works like your works all nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you O Lord and shall glorify your name for you are great and do wondrous things you alone are God. Let's sing, How Great Thou Art.
on as we sing hymn of heaven. The words here, there will be a day when all will bow before him. There'll be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. Let's sing together. Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all here today. 
Feels like back home outside, but it's something I definitely don't miss. <laughs> um, so some announcements. Uh, if you're here for the first time, we're glad to see you. There's uh, information about the church and a welcome gift in the commons. For those joining us online, uh, um, we thank you for allowing us in your home. And if you're here for the first time, please type new in, in the comments section. Um, hopefully you all received the program, which includes the uh, prayer guide. Um, and then also event information uh, throughout the, the program. And it's also available by a link in the comment stream. Uh, following the service, the cafe and the next step groups are canceled so that you all can enjoy time with y'all's families. Um, Saturday on the 13th of August at 8 p.m., fireworks are hosted by Eric Sandin um, at 48 Middle Road in Hancock, New Hampshire. On 20 August, there is a one-day VBS. That's a Saturday. Uh, sign up is on the Commons or online, and then you can call the office with any questions. Um, as of Friday, August 5th, uh, New Hope had registered six children. Uh, Bethany Bible Chapel had registered eight. And so far, we haven't registered any. Um, but the registration cutoff date is 17 August. So you still, you all still have some time on that. Um, rally day for uh, the, the new school year for Sunday school is on uh, 4 September. And um, there's more details about that in the church bulletin. Also in the church bulletin are details on the annual church picnic, which is on 11 September following the service. Um, our speaker today has been here once before, is Jim Grumbine, an elder at New Hope Baptist. Um, we hope that uh, following the service, you greet him, his wife, Emily, and their beautiful daughter as they stand out in the commons as uh, you leave. Uh, she's a cutie, I really do miss that age. <laughs> Um, also, uh, we thank you, as always, for supporting God's work here at Bethany when you pass by the giving station. Uh, please continue to pray for our missionaries. Tim and Kira are on their way back to Uganda, and we hold them in prayer. Um, pray for all our missionaries. Pray for revival. Uh, Randy Heimela will be leading us in prayer, congregational prayer, and following that, Mary Alm will come up and give us our scripture reading, and then Jim Grumbine will offer us our message, uh, which we hope um, will go deep into your hearts and will sustain you until we can meet again next week as a family in Christ. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I have to say there's one thing that Al said that I disagree with, and that's the weather. I could take this all year round. <laughs> well, we have some uh, prayers you may or may not be aware of. We want to uh, pray for the Halfrey family in the passing of Kayla's aunt, Georgette Case. She passed away Tuesday. Barbara Bourne, Debbie Walgren's mother, who is in the hospital in Burlington, Vermont, with a fractured pelvis and, a, and COVID and she had internal bleeding possibly, but that actually isn't happening anymore. So we're thankful for that. We wanna pray for Priscilla Petrie, who is awaiting medical tests. We wanna pray for Pat Westbury, who will be having cortisone injections for pain on the 17th of August. And Alan Dunn is home, home from rehab. He's recovering from COVID and his wife Carol is also home recovering from COVID. Well, she's tested positive. Hopefully it's not too severe. Um, so we want to pray for healing for them. So if you will bow with me, we'll approach the Lord together. Father God, with thankfulness and humbleness, we approach you. We know, Lord, that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we can approach you with all of our praise, all of our concerns. We thank you so much, Lord, for this fellowship that we could have to learn your word, to learn your truth, to become more like Christ through understanding your word. We thank you, Lord, for providing for us in all of our, 
all of our needs, not so much our wants, but our needs. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a country that we can be free to worship you. And we thank you, Lord, for um, all your provisions for us. We pray right now, Lord, for the Halfrey family and the passing of Kayla's aunt. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, give them comfort. May we be a comfort to Kayla as she goes through this difficult time. We pray, Father, that you'd help them turn to you in their time of mourning. We pray, Father God, for Barbara Bourne. We know that she's dealing with fractured hip and COVID and it's difficult because people can't really visit her. We pray, Father, you would help her in this time. We pray that she would lean on you and you would be her healer. We pray for Priscilla Petrie awaiting medical tests. We pray, Lord, that you would be working in that whole thing, giving the doctors wisdom to know what could be going on for her, helping them to treat her. We would pray, Lord, for Pat Westbury, who is gonna have the cortisone injections on the 17th. We pray, Lord, that this would be effective, that you would help her with her pain and that she would be able to uh, continue to live life pain-free. We pray, Lord, for Alan Dunn and Carol, who are both home recovering from COVID. We pray, Lord, that you would um, be their healer, help them to keep their faith, knowing that you're in charge and you're in control. We pray for Judy Richardson. Her sodium numbers have lowered, but she's still having pain. And we know, Lord, that you can help her with this. We know that you are the healer. You are the great physician. And we pray for Pam Katosh. She's uh, having issues, Lord. We, they weren't able to do her heart catheterization and they're trying to figure out how to help her breathe better. We pray, Lord, that you would help her with this whole difficulty. We thank you so much for her faithfulness and we ask that you would help her to continue to put her faith in you, knowing that you are in control. Joni Elborn had a cortisone shot for her shoulder pain. It didn't really help her, Lord. And with her job, it's difficult constantly lifting things and being on her feet all day. We pray, God, that you'd help her relieve her pain. We pray for Kathy McKay, who experienced a COVID rebound, and now it's turned into bronchitis. We pray, Lord, that you would be with her and help her also. We pray for those in our lives, the unsaved, that either don't know about you or have just chosen to not know you, Lord. Maybe they have a willful ignorance towards you, Lord. We pray that you would work in their hearts. We want to be the instruments to help you bring them to Christ. We know, Lord, that no man can bring people to Jesus, only your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a testimony to Christ. We pray, Lord, for our church. You'd help us to continue in our prayer, continue in becoming more like Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to seek your word more, to desire your word more. And we pray, Lord, for uh, this service, that you'll be with uh, Jim Grumbine. As he speaks to us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts, help us to understand your word better. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. 
Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his likelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent it all, there, across, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent, them, sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your ser hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you for that worship time. Thank you for the reading of the word. Um, I love having the opportunity to come and speak while Ruben's away. I will say, if you're a first-time visitor, uh, please come back next week and the week after. Uh, there's better preaching on the way. And, uh, but I'm excited to be here this morning. I, I, love, I love coming to Bethany. Um, in particular, I grew up in a church in Portland, Maine. My father is a minister, and we attended a church uh, that he preached at that looks eerily similar to this building, same color scheme. Sitting here is, is really comfortable for me and uh, enjoyable. It brings me back to being a kid sitting in the auditorium. But the one difference is the, um, the parsonage that we lived in was right beside the church. It was eight feet away from the church. It shared a common driveway. So everything that went on in the church you know, impacted us where we lived in the parsonage. And um, I was thinking as I was sitting here, uh, there was a time when I was 12 or 13 uh, about that age, and my father came one school morning and woke me up really early before school. And he said, hey, why don't you grab your baseball bat and meet me downstairs? So look, I had done Little League for two or three years. I wasn't great. But I thought maybe my dad had higher hopes for me, and this was going to be some father-son bonding time, and we were going to start practicing baseball before school, right? So I grabbed my hat and my glove and my baseball bat, and I meet him downstairs. And he sees me all ready and he goes, what's all this stuff for? I said, you told me to get my baseball stuff. He goes, I told you to get your bat. He goes, the silent alarm's going off at the church. The police are coming, but I thought we'd head over there first in case we find somebody. I'm 12. In case we find somebody? He had long since given up on my ability to hit a curveball, And he thinks now, given the opportunity, I might I don't even know what with a baseball bat, but um, my sermon this morning is called Lessons of the Father. I don't know that there's a lesson in that story other than if we're going to do something, we're going to do it together, I guess. But um, I'm really glad to be here. I love having the opportunity to preach the word. And um, so we're going to look this morning at a passage that maybe everyone or most of us are very familiar with. Um, we just read the scripture about it. And um, most of us know it as uh, the prodigal son. It's a parable that Jesus told. We're going to look at it a little bit different this morning because I want to focus on one of the names of God, right? And that name is Father. So we know that in biblical times, names were chosen after a great deal of deliberation because names have meaning. Biblical names often describes an attribute of a person. So 
Peter, the disciple Peter, for instance, means rock. Abraham means many or father of many. The name Hannah means favor or grace. Um, also, there's, there's many specific names of God that have meaning as well, and we encounter them throughout the Bible. So Elohim means God's incredible power and might, or he is the one and only. Yahweh, right? We're familiar with Yahweh. It's derived from the Hebrew word for I am. El Roy means the God who sees, and El Shaddai means God Almighty. This morning, we're going to look at the name that Jesus himself referred to God as, specifically the name that Jesus uses almost entirely when he speaks of God, and that is the name Father. And he told us to call God Father as well. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. In fact, every single time that Jesus spoke of God, he referred to him as Father, except for once. There was one time in his ministry that he didn't, and that was in Matthew's account of the crucifixion when Jesus hung on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This name for God, Father, or Abba, it's intimate because it portrays a relationship between God and us. It's also descriptive because fathers have responsibilities. And so the term father carries with it great meaning for our relationship with God. Now we also have to recognize that for some of us, the model set by our earthly father can leave this term feeling flat or lacking. Like I said, I grew up in the home uh, of a pastor. Uh, I have a close relationship with my father, but he would be the first to tell you that things were not done perfectly. I know that some have experienced abuse at the hands of their fathers. Some grew up with a missing father, and some grew up with a father who wasn't missing, but things at home might have been better if he was, right? The trouble we run into sometimes as Christians is that we take something that's very familiar to us, like the word father, and we apply earthly attributes to a heavenly, perfect God. We see things through the filter of our own world and our life experiences, and that vision is all we have to go by when we think about heavenly things. And so without finding examples in the Bible where God shows us what it means to be a father, our vision for that term isn't complete. So another example would be marriage, right? Our understanding of biblical marriage can't be based simply on our own marriage experience but rather on God's description of marriage, which he demonstrates between Christ and his bride, the church. So since we're told to call God Father, as he teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, we're going to look at a text that's very familiar to us, as I said, that will help us understand the character of God as a father, good and perfect father that we sing about during praise and worship time, and the father that we're to emulate as we seek to live for him on earth. So let's pray together, and then we'll get right into the scripture. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you for the sunshine, I thank you for the heat, Lord, all that you've created. We are glad to be in your house this morning. We are glad to have your word, and we're glad to call you Father. And we're thankful, Lord, that you see us as your children, uh, because as we'll see, that, that is an incredible privilege for us, and uh, we are thankful, Lord. Father, I just pray your blessing of the word this morning, that every heart uh, would be open and touched by it, and that the Holy Spirit's work uh, would take place today and all throughout the week. In your name I pray, amen. So the second half of Luke 15, which we just read, is referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Um, because of that title, we're directed to think that this chapter is primarily focused on the one son, the one who acted as a prodigal. And if you focus solely on his life and his actions and decisions, you would find a story of loss, repentance, new life, and you can actually walk away feeling very uplifted because at the end, all seems to be resolved for this son after what appears to be a very rocky start to the story. And this is probably the point of view of this parable that many are familiar with. 
Tim Keller teaches a series on this parable called The Prodigal God. And it switches the focus away from the son who left the father and emphasizes the decisions and the actions of the father who's dealing with not one, but two very sinful sons. In fact, what you find in a nutshell is that the second son is no more serving the father for the right reasons than his brother was who ran away. They both allow selfish ambition to drive their behavior even though their choices look entirely different. But we're going to look at this parable by focusing our attention on the father as a model of God's love and his behavior towards us. Because we are not the father in the story, so we can learn from him. You and I are the sons. We're either one or the other. Uh, we're the one who ran away or the one who stayed behind waiting for his moment to come. I, I found something by R.C. Sproul once that said, if you're ever reading the, the scripture and you wonder who you are in the story, right? We read scripture and we try to apply it to our lives and we insert ourselves into the scripture. So R.C. Sproul says, if you're reading the scripture and you wonder who you are in the story, you're the sinner, okay? <laughs> so it's natural, like if we read this parable, we're going to identify with one of the sons, but it's the father who offers us a glimpse into how our Heavenly Father acts towards us. So let's train ourselves for a few minutes to hear these scriptures from the point of view of the Father. Let's look at his actions and choices because that's where today's lesson is found. So Luke 15, picking up in verse 11, and he said, this is Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So this younger son asked for his inheritance. In this culture, the younger of two sons would be due one third of the father's estate. But here's what we need to remember. There's no savings account. There's no bag of money sitting around. An inheritance is land. An inheritance is everything that the father and his father and his father's father have built up and have acquired over time. So there's no way to give the son what he's asking without the father selling a portion of the land that he's owned possibly for many generations. This question in and of itself is humiliating for the father. He's being asked to give up something that literally represents his standing in the community. That's what land represented. It was his ability to earn a living, his ability to employ others, and take care of himself. The other thing that's really glossed over in this ask from the son is that the inheritance was only passed down upon death. In essence, when the son says, Father, give me my share of the inheritance, He's wishing his father dead. People listening to this parable at the time that Jesus told it would have understood that, that these were the cultural laws at that time, so they would have seen what this request of the son meant to the father. Picking up in verse 13, it says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So the son blows through his money quickly. Famine hits the land, so he hires himself out to a pig farmer, longing just to be fed the food that the animals are eating. When we get into 17 and 18 and verse 19 now, you'll see he formulates a plan. Verse 17, so he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I'm perishing here with hunger. I will arise, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me as one of your hired servants. Now, if you don't think that this section is about you and I, then we're really missing the point. The son's plan here is timeless. 
This is the same thing we do every time we're caught in sin. When we're backed up against a wall, we begin the bargaining process with God, even in our mind. Because for some reason, we continue to think that's what's necessary. That's what's necessary for him to take us back. We think if I come back and I repent and I won't do it again, and you don't even have to think of me as your son, I'll just be a servant, then the Father will make things right. But look at 20. This is where it gets really good. Verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And this is the first lesson about the father. Our father, God, is watching for us as this father was in the story. It says, while he was a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran to him. This father must have been on a high elevation or standing on his roof or watching from a window, but nevertheless, he was watching. He was watching expectantly for the return of his son. He runs to embrace him. Now, this is something else that Tim Keller taught in his study on this. Running for a landowner, a man, a leader in the community, this was not done in this culture. He goes on to say that children run, servants were, would run if they were told to, but for a dignified landowner in this culture, he would have to lift up his robe, bare his legs, and run, and it just simply wouldn't be done. This father's a rule breaker. He's just like our God. He ran because he was expectantly watching for the return of his son. Now in verse 21, it says, the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So remember, he had this plan and he was gonna say all these things to the father. And it said that he had gone to a far off land. So he had a long time to rehearse this. You know, like when you're driving and you're about to have an important conversation and you just rehearse it and rehearse it. So the son sees his father, his father's running towards him. And as soon as he sees his father, he starts the explanation. He starts asking for forgiveness and he gets about halfway through it. But the father said to his servants in verse 22, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. And this is the second lesson from the father. We don't earn our way back. The father's grace takes us back. The son never even got to the part where he was going to earn his way. He never got to say, I'll be, just, I'll be a servant. Just let me work for the daily bread. The father cut him off. This father is so excited, he's not even listening to his son. He brought his servants with him. And he's telling this servant, get him a robe. Tells the other servant, get him new shoes. Get him a ring. Kill a calf, right? Any good parent is going to quickly look their child up and down and appraise all their needs. The son had been living with pigs. He stunk and he needed a new robe. He had gone on a far journey. He probably needed shoes. The ring signified that he was part of the family and the calf meant he was gonna eat again after being in a severe famine. This father was addressing all his needs, physical and spiritual, because the feast meant he was gonna be brought back into the family too. One thing we should note about the ring. So in verse 22, it says, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. It's quick, but you have to know what the ring means. And this is the third, the third lesson, that children enjoy the benefits of their father. See, the ring is a signet ring. A signet ring, ring contains the family seal. And what it means is that the person wearing it is from a particular family, and they enjoy all the benefits and privileges of that family. So to wear that ring, that son is now entitled to whatever standing his father has in the community. I was trying to think of an example, and again, I go back to my childhood and where I was living in Portland. Um, there was a number of schools in the area, and there were two local kids 
from a school that I didn't go to, and I never knew these guys, a guy named Joey and a guy named Nick, and they passed by my house every day when I was in junior high on their way back home. And every day if they saw me, they harassed me. Every day they bullied me. Once in a while it was physical, but mostly it was just intimidation. This, this went on for a long time. And one day it ended in a very physical confrontation. And when my father came home from work later that day and found out about it, he drove me down the street. He had looked up the address of this, this guy, Joey, who was kind of the ringleader. And we went to his house. And my dad knocked on the door. And I remember this like it was yesterday. Put his arm around me and held me slightly behind him and asked for the father. And when Joey's father came to the door, my dad told him in no uncertain terms, this is ending today because this is my son and I stand between you and him now. That's what it means to wear the ring. When this son was given the ring of the father, all that the father had and was able to provide, the son now was entitled to. And this is a lesson about our father. In Exodus 14, 14, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need be still. This is the privilege of being a child of the Heavenly Father. So finally, in verse 24, the Father says, The Son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This brings us to my final point. The Father leaves the 99 to pursue the one. Luke chapter 15, the same chapter, opens up with Jesus telling another parable about the lost sheep. When a man who had a hundred sheep lost just one, he dropped everything he was doing. He left the 99 so he could pursue the one until it was found. The father we just read about in this parable says, let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He's just like that one sheep. When he first spotted his son far off, the father left his work behind. He had his servants drop what they were doing. He left his household, his duties, his possessions, and he pursued the returning son. He called for a great feast and celebration for the lost son who had returned, just like a shepherd who had found his missing sheep. Who here knows that at some point in your life, you were the missing sheep? I was the missing sheep. There was a day that I was the one missing, and my father left the 99 for me. If you have salvation in your heart, if you've been saved by God, then you better believe that there was a day that you were the one, you were the missing sheep, and your salvation is that important to our Father that he leaves the 99 to pursue you. I think about Psalm 23 and the description of a good shepherd, and I can't read this chapter in Luke and this Father and not see the parallels. So in Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Think about the son coming home and the father giving him food, water, a place to sleep, clothing him again. Psalm 23 continues, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. The father threw a feast the moment the son came home. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just like this father, he brought the son back into his house to dwell there. So I'll leave you today uh, as we think about what a meaningful blessing it is to call our God Father. I'll read you with one last writing from R.C. Sproul. He wrote a short devotion entitled, What Does It Mean to Call God Father? And I'd love for you just to listen as I read this excerpt from it and apply it to your hearts. What does it mean to call God Father? One of the most well-known statements of the Christian faith is the Lord's Prayer, which begins with the words, Our Father which art in heaven. 
This is the part of the universal treasury of Christendom. When I hear Christians in a private gathering praying individually, almost every single person begins their prayer by addressing God as Father. There's nothing more common among us than to address God as our Father. So central is that to our Christian experience that in the 19th century, there were some who said the basic essence of the whole Christian religion can be reduced to two points, the universal brotherhood of man and the universal fatherhood of God. In that context, I'm afraid we have missed one of the most radical teachings of Jesus. A few years ago, a German scholar was doing research in New Testament literature, and he discovered that in the entire history of Judaism, in all existing books of the Old Testament, all existing books of extra-biblical Jewish writings dating from the beginning of Judaism until the 10th century AD in Italy, there is not a single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly in the first person as father. Not one. There were appropriate forms of address that were used by Jewish people in the Old Testament, and the children were trained to address God in proper phrases of respect. All these titles were memorized, and the term father was not among them. The first Jewish rabbi to call God father directly was Jesus of Nazareth. It was a radical departure from tradition, and in fact, in every recorded prayer we have from the lips of Jesus, except for one, he calls God Father. It was for that reason that many of Jesus' enemies sought to destroy him because he assumed to have his intimate, personal relationship with the sovereign God of heaven and the creator of all things. And he dared to speak in such intimate terms with God. What's even more radical is that Jesus says to his people, when you pray, you say, our Father. He has given to us the right and the privilege to come into the presence of the majesty of God and address him as Father, because indeed, he is our Father. He has adopted us into his family and made us co-heirs with his only begotten Son. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this scripture. Thank you for being our Father, and thank you for calling us to be your children. Lord, may we never forget the privilege it is to have you as Father, the protection, the joy, all, that's, all that comes with being a child of the King. We love you, Lord. Please help us to apply these scriptures to our heart throughout the day and in the coming weeks. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for that great message. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn together, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
and for your benediction, the blessing from Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord 